Internet, hello you lovelies. This is my most requested video to date and that makes me so happy because it's comic book based. So many of you asked me to make a comic book recommendation for season two of X-Men 97. So these are the books I think based off the events of X-Men 97 and especially the finale of X-Men 97 that will enhance your experience and prepare you for season two. Now if this video does well, I am planning on making a season one video deep diving into all the books that influenced where we already saw these mutants go in season one. So hopefully you like this one. If it does well enough, I will do another about season one. Please do show you like this by leaving a comment below. Let me know what of these runs you're gonna check out. Let me know what of these runs you've already read and let me know what other things like this you want me to make you guys are my co-hosts you steer this ship so please let me know what you want to see and i'll do it uh also please hit that like button so i know that you like this video please hit that notification bell my goal was 25k in may we are cruising towards 26,000 this month which makes me so very excited so very appreciative without further ado let's talk about the comic books you should read before x-men 97 season two give them the forecast all right, now, first of all, I want to say X-Men 97 Season 1 was absolutely incredible. Season 2 has a high bar to live up to, but I think it can because of some of the comics I'm about to mention. Now, these comics, I'm going to do a top 7 that I'd recommend you read. Like, the 7 essential runs, I know comics can be intimidating. I know it's a medium not a lot of people have a lot of experience in, but a lot of these are shorter runs or very approachable runs. So, I'm going to give us 7 essentials and then three bonus. So basically, I would recommend reading all 10, but I don't want it to seem too intimidating, so I'm gonna do a seven, and then at the end of this video, there is a certain cameo from uh, someone who worked on X-Men 97, giving their recommendation that isn't necessarily tied to the show, but their favorite, X-Men run they're going to talk about in that video at the end of this. All right, so my first recommendation without further ado whatsoever is going to be Rise of Apocalypse. Rise of Apocalypse is only a four-issue series. This is so easy, so approachable, and as you can see, they're clearly getting some inspiration about how we're going to introduce this different younger apocalypse from this run. This basically deals with Apocalypse being cast out. Un Sabanur, before he was known as Apocalypse, was cast out by his people for his very clear visible mutation. And that's what led to the survival of the fittest mentality that he is so known for. So these are kind of Apocalypse origin stories here. And if you can find the 2016 reprint that looks like this, it also has some really fun stuff with not just Dracula, but also some characters you might recognize that they might tease in the series going forward. So look for this. As a little bonus, also check out Blood of Apocalypse if you want. It's not as good, it's not as regarded, it's not as beloved, but it does feature Gambit as one of the Horsemen of Apocalypse. So if you want a little bonus material, also check out Blood of Apocalypse. All right, my second recommendation is going to be The Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix, and I think this is just as important as Rise of Apocalypse. This is basically where we left off with our X-Men in the finale, as in the other team of X-Men. One is set in ancient Egypt, the other is in the future. That happens in this comic. Half the X-Men are split and are stuck in ancient Egypt, and these X-Men, specifically Jean and Scott, are in a future where they're dealing with, basically, Nathan as in this storyline, figuring out the Strife element. This storyline is actually the one that separates Nathan and Strife narratively, so you understand more what's going on, and this introduces the idea of them raising him kind of in secret. They go by Slim and Red here. They, they don't really let Nathan know the whole situation. So I think this is going to be very important. So if you want to just keep track of the past storyline, Rise of Apocalypse. If you want to keep track of the future storyline, it looks like we're getting. Check out the adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix. All right, I think the third most important is Age of Apocalypse. This seems like kind of a no-brainer. This is one of the biggest events in comics. This is one of my favorite Elseworlds of all time. This is also a very approachable comic if you're not used to reading comics because it's new continuity. These don't tie in. It does tie in in the overall apocalypse story, but if you've never read X-Men, there is a lot of the archetypal character use here in new and exciting ways. Wolverine isn't the Wolverine you know. He's had his arm chopped off. He can still pop his blades through the stub. It's a very different version of the character. A lot of these characters Actually, some new characters pop up that then get brought in, but a lot of these characters are reinventions of the ones you know and love. This is what I think a lot of the season could deal with. Now, they did a great job in season one where they kind of misled us. We thought we were going to get some thir certain things like Operation Zero Tolerance or Onslaught or those things. This might be one of those where we don't go full Age of Apocalypse, but we might. And no matter what, it's a really fun comic run, and it's very contained to itself. And just check out this big 
Omnibus. Uh, check check out the trade that looks like this, and you'll get the whole story. Highly recommend it. All right, my fourth highest recommendation, and I'm doing these kind of in order of how impactful and important I do think they'll be to the show. And number four out of the seven must-reads is, I think, The Twelve. Now, this isn't a beloved arc. This is kind of a controversial arc. But at the end of the day, this is not only a key apocalypse story where he kind of ascends and achieves godhood, but it's also the story where Wolverine gets his adamantium back. So you noticed at the end of X-Men 97 season one, he lost his adamantium. And I'm going to talk about that in one of the bonus arcs, but this is where he gets it back. So the feral Wolverine story kind of concludes here. There's a lot of really important stuff and a lot of the support system for the X-Men. There's 12 key members of this tribunal. This is something I think you should check out before the show. All right, my number five most important pull, only because I don't know how much they'll dive into it solo, is going to be Wolverine Feral. Now, this is actually something that lasted a very long time. He loses his adamantium in Wolverine 75 and doesn't regain it until Wolverine 145. That's 70 issues without adamantium. On average, comics come out once a month. They might have been coming out every two weeks in this era. I don't remember. I was young. But say it's once a month, that's 70 months. That's six years of a bone claw at most times feral Wolverine. So of these, I would highly recommend you check out this collection. This collection here is going to give you so much of that 75 through 145. This actually collects 76 through 101. So this is going to be a big part of that. You can check out 75 as part of the Fatal Attraction storyline. I would check out the Fatal Attraction storyline trade. Boop, looks like this. But if you want just that fallout from the moment you saw in X-Men 97, then check this out because 76 picks up right after that moment you saw in Episode 9. This moment, that is this moment, is this. But if you want to pick up right from there, then check out this Feral Arc it's one of the uh, master editions, so it's a beautiful collection. It collects a lot of X-Men lore, and there's a couple uncanny X-Men issues in here. There's a couple annuals. There's other stuff that ties in. So this gives you a really good baseline. Over two years of comic books, right here, all dealing with Boneclaw, Feral Wolverine. Lots of him finding himself, lots of him discovering his humanity again. And the 145 goes to this stuff here with the 12 and back to Apocalypse. So it always cycles around. That's why I think this moment with Magneto in the episode 9... That leading back to Apocalypse, him getting his adamantium back, is all going to be part of the story of Season 2, so I'd check out some of this. All right, now my sixth pull and sixth of importance is because I don't know where this is going to end because it's ongoing, is X-Men 97, the current ongoing comic right now. As of filming this, issue number three came out a couple days ago. I'm filming this Friday, it came out Wednesday. It is still currently in the shops and I haven't read it yet. So issue three is right now, but what was cool about issues one and two is it filled in some gaps. For example, Gene and Scott already knew they were pregnant in X-Men 97 season one. We, we heard it as if it already you know was discussed. Issue one or two filled in the gaps and had the moment where Scott told Gene. That's, that's essential, but we didn't miss it in the show. We just, we went on. So this is going to be filling in some gaps. And I'm wondering if by the end of this series, there's some stuff filling in the gaps between season one and season two. I don't know for sure. I didn't write these comics, but... I would bet there are some seeds planted in the books as well as some filler between season one and two in here. So I would pick up X-Men 97 one and two, one because they're good issues, issue three out right now, and keep reading to see if it ties into season two before we get season two next year. So X-Men 97 is my sixth pick. And my final of the must-reads or should-reads, my seventh pull of the seven books you should read before season two is going to be Onslaught. Onslaught is a giant, giant saga. Onslaught is a huge mega epic that was largely teased in the finale. That conversation between Xavier and Eric in Eric's mind is, I think, the seeds being planted for Onslaught. I think we are going to get Onslaught maybe season two, maybe of the cliffhanger for season two going into a giant Marvel animation spanning event in season three. But I do think that Onslaught mislead was only a temporary mislead. I think season two is going to be largely apocalypse-based, hence my pulls here, especially with the Wolverine Feral Claws, especially with some of the storylines of teased. I personally think my big theory is it's going to be three timelines. One timeline is going to be the past, one the future, one the present, and the one in the present is going to give us some new X-Men like Kitty Pride, who we've never seen on the show, like Havoc getting more time on the show, like maybe new teams like Generation X, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. But I think essential reading to prepare for how that season ends, the end of season two, I think will either be this or setting up 
this. That's the only reason it's so low. This book is the most 90s event of all 90s events. This book gets so big, most of the heroes, like Fantastic Four, most of the Avengers, and the X-Men, all sacrifice themselves to take out this deity, this beast, and it's still a problem today. There's still, there, was, there is a current ongoing Wolverine title called Weapon X-Men that is about multiversal X-Men teaming up from all different universes brought together by Jean Grey to take out another Onslaught today, like in today's comics. So Onslaught still a force, still a reckoning, and it all started here. This led to Heroes Reborn. This led to a lot of new versions of heroes. But this trade right here collects all of it. So this is issues of Hulk. This is issues of Fantastic Four. This is lots and lots of X-Men. This is the big series of Onslaught and the connecting tissues. So if you want like a big dose of 90s, check this out. Now, I always get this question, and before I get to the three bonuses, I do want to say a great way to find comics is at your library. And if they don't have the physical copies, you can get a digital library card. Hoopla is what I use. And a lot of times they'll have digital copies you can rent. So I know a lot of people can't afford to read all these comics. I just gave you guys like 50 comic recommendations. They're all collected, but this would probably be about 100 issues. Between 50 and 100. I'm not sure it didn't count. There's a lot of stuff here. So what you can do is rent digitally. Also, Marvel Unlimited. These are all Marvel comics. X-Men's Marvel. You can check out Marvel Unlimited and get all of these because they're all older than six months. For like six bucks a month. It's like seven bucks a month. I don't know, know what it is, but it's a cheap monthly fee that gives you tens of thousands of comics that you can read for that monthly fee. It's less than most streaming services. So if you feel like you can't afford comic books, there are other ways. Most of these are going to be available at local comic shops. That's what I would love if you could do because it's supporting the comics. It's supporting the comic shops. It's supporting this medium, I'm, this medium I love. But if you can't, check out Hoopla. Check out your library. Check out ways of getting it. Go to secondhand bookstores. A lot of these are classic enough. Hundreds of people bought them. You can get after them. All right, my first of the bonuses. We did the seven must-reads. Now let's get to the bonuses. I like three, making it even ten. But these are the three bonuses, starting with Grand Design. Grand Design is a giant collection summarizing decades of X-Men lore in a few trades. This particular copy collects all of it. This is every bit of Grand Design, and this tells about 50 years of comics. And the way that's done is Ed Piscor, a, a very encyclopedic uh, mind about comic books, made old Sunday newspaper type comics retelling in brief these huge stories. And this basically brings all of that together in a few trades, and this collection in particular tells all of it. So Phoenix Saga is going to be like 10 pages, which was actually like 20 comics times 24, 400 pages. So you can get a rough catch up. This is like watching previously on the comic. So it's in the old Sunday newspaper animated style, and it's literally all of the X-Men retold in this really interesting way. So if you want to read X-Men, but you don't want to catch up by, re re you don't want to catch up by reading everything from the 60s on, this will catch you up in a way that kind of gives you the now that's what I call X-Men in short, and I think that's worth it if you want to dive into the newer stuff. My second pull is going to be Vulcan-based. Now, Vulcan is Cyclops' other brother. We know Havoc very well, but Vulcan actually appeared in an episode, I think it was episode 6 of X-Men 97, and I was shocked because Vulcan is not that common. He's a pretty deep pull. He's the third Summers brother. Vulcan might tie into stuff with Sinister. He's always been obsessed with the Bloodline, and we're obviously seeing Season 2 go into Family. So, if they go anywhere near the Summers again, and we did see Havoc in the finale, this image popped up, and this guy popped up earlier, I think we're going to deal with some Summers drama, as we always do. Vulcan, I would highly recommend checking out Deadly Genesis, which is this right here. It is a genius miniseries written by the man who brought back Winter Soldier. The guy, the guy who brought Bucky back and turned him into Winter Soldier is named Ed Brubaker. Ed Brubaker wrote X-Men for a time, and he wrote this incredible run dealing with an uh, uh, extinction-level event for the X-Men. Deadly Genesis is great, and that leads right into a very important Vulcan run that starts the Uncanny X-Men 475. This here collects all the Vulcan stuff. It goes from 475 to 486, if I remember correctly. This is all that in one collection. So, Deadly Genesis and this all come together in one big Vulcan story that I think maybe, deep cut, might be important for Season 2. My number 10th pull, and this is more of a selfish pull than anything, is going to be Generation X. I love this title. I love Generation X. It's so weird. It is illustrated by Chris Pacello, an artist I really love because of how weird it is. This is not a very approachable comic. It's kind of deep cuts. Jubilee is a very large fixture of it. Emma Frost and Banshee lead a team, and that team is a lot of off-kilter X-Men. Skin, Monet, Chamber, one of my favorite X-Men of all time, blew half his face off, and now it's this fiery, psionic 
ever percolating energy. It's a crazy book. It's, it's weird. It's out there. But it is very 90s. And that 90s element makes me think maybe if we catch up to 98, they want to bring in some new teams. They might do X-Factor. They might do X-Force. They might do any number of X teams. But the most 90s of those teams is Generation X. And selfishly, it's a team I love. So volume one is this right here. It goes like a hundred and some issues, but this is going to give you the first taste of it and then keep going if you like it. But I highly recommend this if you like the 90s stuff. And if you want a curveball, the 10th issue of my, I mean, the 10th the pull of these 10 recommendations is the most out of left field. It's the most me saying maybe, but then the ninth is something that's also kind of a deep pull. And the seventh is obviously just to catch you up on X-Men. That's why these three were bonuses. So I'm going to leave them in a comment below. You can see all of this in the description of the video. As I said before, check your local comic shop first if you can, and if not, there's plenty of other places to get comics like libraries and supporting the books. If you rent from the library, Marvel still gets notified, so it still helps the creators out in some way, so I would recommend that. Now, without further ado, my friend Charlie Feldman is one of the most important and impactful voices in X-Men 97. They're very humble about it, they wouldn't say so, but they were the first person brought on as a writer once Bo DeMeo was hired as showrunner and they wrote on the entirety of the season. They are one of the biggest X-Men fans I know. And they, we had an interview today uh, that's going to be on Real Rejects in the next week, maybe two, talking about the whole season. And while we're discussing it, I thought it'd be fun to add to this video a snippet of their favorite comic run, which we've talked about a lot. It's not anything based on season one. It's not anything based on season two. It's not going to be a spoiler, but I thought as a little bonus, I would attach this here. Interstitial. Got a celebrity shot a la Beer Pong. This is Charlie Feldman, writer of X-Men 97. I want to know, one of the writers, and humble, <laughs> what a comic within the X-Men pantheon, not necessarily related to season one, you'd recommend. I'm going to ruin this question and oh. say you need to uh, do a big epic first, which is Avengers Disassembled, Get to the end of Avengers Disassembled so you're ready for House of M, which is my favorite run of any comic of maybe all time. Uh, it'll give you a better perspective of WandaVision, that's for sure, but also just the deep emotional resonance of what you can do while subverting a world. House of M is the best. This is also a fellow Bendis Uncanny X-Men fan, yeah. and we have an interview coming up very soon on Real Rejects talking all about X-Men 97, so be sure to check that out. I love that show so much. Read House of M. That is going to do it for this episode. Like, subscribe. Please, I want to keep growing this channel, and I'm so glad you guys wanted this video. This meant a lot to me because it shows that you guys are checking out comics, and that means a lot. I'll talk to you soon.